Welcome to Calumet Roundtable. It's our student-produced interview program that features scholars and experts and their academic research. Uh, my guest today is Dr. William Pels, a historian in European and labor history, a distinguished scholar, published uh, books, Spartacus Bun and the German Working Class Movement Against Capitalism, the European Left on the March, Karl Marx, A World to Win. He's had numerous articles published in the American Historical Review, Science and Society, uh, Journal of European Studies. I'm probably leaving many out, uh, Bill. Um, but we're here to talk about his new book, um, Eugene V. Debs Reader, Socialism and the Class Struggle, just out this year. Um, I think this will be of interest to our readers, uh, to our listeners, to, to hear what's in the book. Uh, there's three reasons, I think, that we may be interested in this for the Calumet Roundtable. Uh, the first, you probably know this, that Debs is from Indiana, mm -hmm. uh, Terre Haute. In fact, he has a, uh, his birthplace is now a historical site, even though it's not recognized by the uh, official, uh, officialdom. It's supported by, uh, largely by donations. Uh, the second reason is that we're entering the 21st century, and it's interesting to note that the social movements and even electoral support for socialism is on the rise almost everywhere from Venezuela to Bolivia to Spain to Greece. Exactly. Even in the U.S., you probably know uh, the city council member that was elected for uh, in Seattle, uh, Kashama Sawant. Mm -hmm. And I understand the labor movement in Ohio took its distance from the Democratic Party and have talked about a labor party. So there's some similarities um, between, I guess as a historian, this uh, rings well to your ears that we can learn things from the past. Um, and actually, that's where I uh, would like to start. Um, I thought it might be a good idea for us to understand what is the context or what is, uh, what's going on 100 years ago that, at the time of Debs when he got a million votes. Well, I think what was going on 100 years ago, for better or for worse, is pretty much what's going on now. You had a situation where corporations were completely out of control. The common people were being pushed to the wall. Unions were being smashed and victimized. And more and more, average people felt there was no way they could, they could get ahead. And people like Debs, who didn't start out as a socialist, he actually was a Democrat. I believe he was on the Terre Haute City Council as a Democrat. He saw, at a certain point, having tried to form and successfully lead the American, uh, American Railroad Workers Union, that it was smashed using the Sherman Antitrust Act claiming that labor unions were a violation of free trade. <laughs> and he was sent to jail in Woodstock, Illinois. And there is where he started reading and thinking. And he emerged from that jail as a socialist, realizing. When, when, when would this be? This is a, in the late 19th century. OK. Big Pullman strike, okay. 1890s. And he realized that you had to do something fundamental to change the system, that trying to work within the two-party system and within just the rigid confines of craft unionism, none of that was going to be enough. You had to have something more. And so he gets active in the, in the, the socialist movement and ultimately is able to be one of the key figures in a merged socialist party, which becomes a very important uh, third force in American politics. I, I, um, I read that he received a million votes in 1912. And if you talk about the size of the population, which at that time was 90 million, and half of the people couldn't vote because they were women, this was, and he got a million votes, which would be about uh, 7 million votes today. I mean, that just boggles the mind to think that somebody that was running as a socialist could receive 7 million votes. Um, were there, are, are there other reasons? Um, for that, I, I guess at the time it would be an upsurge of, uh, of interest in socialism, the idea that we live in different social classes. It just seems uh, difficult to fathom in today's um, politics that there are classes. Well, there's been a lot of attempts, many successful, to just promote a consumer society where you're defined not as how you work or how you live, but rather what kind of clothes you wear. You want to be an individual, so you have to go out and buy this particular brand of clothes that only 50 million of your closest friends also wear. Uh, and so the, there's been an attempt to try to do away with class consciousness somewhat successfully. But when times get tough, it becomes apparent that some people have control of the society and some people don't. 
In other words, if you rob a bank, you go to jail. If you steal a bank, you become important <laughs> and you probably become a member of either a Democrat or a Republican's presidential administration. I'm thinking of Goldman Sachs, for, for yeah. instance. I, I, I don't... I I don't remember the exact quote, but you, you reminded me of something where Deb said about a bank robber. Do, does that r ring a bell right. for you? He, it, it, he talks about bank robbers, they're, again, they're just petty crooks, the same thing he talks throughout about, you know, people who are con considered crimes, economic criminals, they really lower the boom on them, right? So if you stick up somebody, that's a big deal. On the other hand, if you rob from thousands or hundreds of thousands, that's called, you know, Entrepreneur. <laughs> um, you're the historian. Um, Debs uh, is a uh, important, I would argue, an important historic figure. She got a million votes, and at a time when there was 1,500 elected socialists in the United States, and he's traveling across the country. But like I said at the top, his home is not a historical monument. Why don't we know um, more about Debs? Well, I think there's been consorted effort to just bury him. So, like, for example, a lot of high school history textbooks and college history textbooks will talk about the 1912 election, and instead of listing Debs' votes, which would be about 6% of the total, they just have others uh -huh. right? because they don't want to talk about his campaign. Now, 1912 was, was a four-way race where you had Teddy Roosevelt, you had Taft, you had Woodrow Wilson, and you had Debs. So it's not just that Debs got a lot of votes and pure protest votes. Political scientists and historians have studied he threw the race in one state after another to one of the other candidates. The other thing I want to point out, as Debs said, I would not be Moses to lead you to the promised land, because if I could lead you in, somebody else could lead you out, mm -hmm. is what he did as a headliner for the rank and file socialists. In other words, he often ran behind the rest of the ticket. So he didn't get to become president, but socialists got to become mayors of Milwaukee. Right? He didn't get elective office, but aldermen throughout urban areas in the United States were elected on the Socialist Party ticket. What made him exceptional to the other candidates, though? Again, we, we don't know about Debs, but some of us do know about Debs. Because cause he was, I think he was the unifier, he was the inspirer. He was, he was the man who could rally the masses. He was sort of the rock star, if you will, of the movement. His okay. speeches just got thunderous applause constantly. And he didn't seem like someone who really cared about getting elected office because, you know, there was different strategies. Some people proposed that, you know, they move him to a left-wing district and actually get him elected to something. Because remember, uh, the Socialist Party at this time had tremendous strength in New York City. They elected a member of the House of Representatives there. They had tremendous strength in Milwaukee, and they elected a congressman, Victor Berger, who, by the way, uh, they elected him, but because he opposed World War I, they refused to seat him. So they called a special election to fill... Uh, Congress refused to seat yes, him? Yes, Congress refused to seat How him. How can you... Again, that seems to fly in the face of... Uh, you, you elect your representative, the representative goes off to Washington, but they're not going to seat him? Well, because... that's, one, that's one of the weaknesses of Debs and the party being Americans. He got up and, you know, and gave speeches against World War I. And if you read those speeches, you will see those speeches are more or less identical to the speeches he'd been giving his entire adult life. War is bad, war profits the capitalists, one group of workers go out and kill another group of workers, doesn't settle anything. He gave that speech in 1918 in Canton, Ohio, was arrested and sentenced to 10 years in jail. But it wasn't just him, so were hundreds and hundreds of other local leaders. The repression during World War I broke the back of his movement. Uh, uh, and, the, and the repression was ostensibly to protect, I mean, what, what was the law? That Espionage they, Act of 1917, okay. giving aid and comfort to the enemy. So the Socialist Party was denied access to the U.S. mails. Their literature was taken off mail cards and publicly burned. Their headquarters were raided. Their printing presses were smashed. Hundreds and hundreds of their local leaders went to prison. And of course, this, sort of like the Japanese internment during World War II, is one of those sort of dirty little secrets of American history that usually aren't mentioned 
yeah, uh, I don't, textbooks. Yeah, I don't remember reading that in my <laughs> U.S. history book that, uh, you know, certain parties weren't able to use the mails or you were arrested. I heard of the Espionage Act, but when I think of the Espionage Act, you think, of spies. Point, you think of spies, German, right? Pels and arts is yeah, running German around spies. spying, but uh, it was used uh, in a much broader, what you're saying, it was a, used in a much broader um, way. Right, like, to give you another example, the socialists in New York elected five people to the state government, to the state legislature. All five were refused their seats. Under the Espionage Un Act? Well, uh, various acts that right. I don't know they were charged with. They you know with just said you're not loyal. You're not supporting the war, and then that's the legal side. That's the stuff we can tell. Many historians point out that 1917, the Chicago Socialists caused close to my heart because I'm from Chicago. Probably won the Chicago elections for mayor. For no, for the city council oh, for right. everything. Won the whole thing, a majority. But there was massive, massive vote fraud. I know your viewers may find that hard to believe <laughs> Chicago. that Chicago <laughs> could have massive vote fraud. Uh, but this was in the past when elections weren't so honest as yeah. later on. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just, just incredible, incredible vote fraud. Uh, some of the Socialist Party candidates didn't get any votes in the precincts they, they voted in, which means we're led to believe they didn't even vote for themselves. And this is a matter of record, and it's published. But again, it's not in our uh, right exactly in our U.S. history books or exactly. uh, recent history. Okay, um, much to learn from much to learn from history. Um, we're going to have to take a break in a in a minute. Um, but I thought that you might uh, start us for what I want to talk about in the second half. I remember a quote, and I'm hoping we can read some quotes from the book. Uh, said something to the effect that. Uh, why he wouldn't support a Democrat or Republican. He said, uh, I, I would rather vote for something that I want and not get it than vote for something that I don't, don't want, want and, and get, get it. It. Um, it seemed like in the 20th century there was a different way of dealing with political parties other than the Democrats and Republicans, just not letting them take their seat. But in today's um, era, there isn't even, in most cases, a third party or a fourth party. But, but it's the same process. In, why bother to prevent them taking their seat? Why not just keep them off the ballot? And if you can't keep them off the ballot... Well, that's what we do now, right? Yes, it, yeah, and if okay. you can't keep them off the ballot, don't allow them any television time. Don't allow them in the debates. Because if you could get a socialist and reasonably get them on the ballot, and then they'd participate in the candidate debates that were on TV, then I'd like to see how well they'd do. Well, our experience is that uh, they get elected. Yes, they so, get elected. Sawant and Seattle exactly. campaign for a fifteen hour, uh, fifteen dollar an hour uh, minimum wage, right. and she won the election for city council in exactly in in, in uh, Seattle. I think we're um, going to have to take a break now. Okay, um, we'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back. This is the Calumet Roundtable. I'm your host, Lee Arts. I teach media studies at Purdue Calumet. And my guest today is Dr. William Pels, who is the author of the brand new book, uh, Eugene V. Debs Reader, Socialism and the Class Struggle. Um, Bill, just before we went to break, I was uh, talking about class. That in the United States today, the idea that we live in a class society is uh, resisted. In fact, that's one of the refrains of the two-party candidates that as soon as somebody says something about wealth or inequality, you're, you're playing the class card or you're asking for a class war. Um, I, just, I just wonder, what's the difference between now and then? Because now we probably have more inequality, right? 1% of the population owns 40% of the wealth. 
it wasn't that even with the trusts at right. Deb's time. So why um, the subtitle of the book is Class Struggle, Recognizing Class. Why don't we see the question of class today? But they did, or at least a good share of them did in the early 20th century. Well, I think there's always sort of a culture lag or a psychological lag. People have been just so inundated with all this commercial propaganda about how we live in the best of all possible worlds and how we don't have classes. And I think that class is really America's dirty little secret. That actually when you ask people and you press them, they realize there are classes. They just don't have any way to articulate it. See, with the Socialist Party, it was like, read the Socialist Press, you know, vote the Socialist ticket, join, join the, the social, <laughs> yeah, join the union and all that. I mean, so th there was some sort of institutional way of them expressing this. Now they just say, nah, they're all the same, I'm not gonna vote. Right. I mean, so there's a certain level that, that apathy is very functional for the system. And that's why Debs always fought against it. But I think you see reactions like that. The problem is they've been sort of uh, incoherent reactions, like the Occupy movement, not having a clear program, or episodic protests uh, up against the World Trade Organization or this or that, all of which were really wonderful on one hand, but they don't lead to a thoroughgoing organized movement that can actually put forward an alternative view. Uh, the other thing that's often mentioned um, is that at the time of Debs, you had newspapers and spoken word. There weren't, radio, there wasn't even radio, there wasn't TV, so the access to communication was fairly well widespread, right? You could it's make much your more newspaper. democratic. Yes, you could have the socialist press or you could have the trade union newsletter or Debs, I've seen pictures of him on the back of a, of a train leaning over the railing as he goes from stop to stop and people would come out to hear him. You don't quite have the access to those kind of crowds today. Um, and the one thing that I was going to ask you to do, and I see you've got a couple pages marked, I hope we can do this, is uh, try to give us a flavor for the kind of rhetoric, the kind of speaker that Debs was, why people might get rallied to his um, rallied to his call because one of the things was this question of class and sure. what kind of society we want to live in. So maybe you can find uh You know, I, when you originally mentioned that, uh, I kind of thought, well, gee, this is the 21st century. Won't it sound all terribly old-fashioned yeah, yeah. and so on? But then rereading it on the, on the train up here, I was kind of shocked as if this could have been written last week. So, for example, in one of his speeches he says, because, you know, people are always asking him what he wants and so on. He says, I believe, as socialists do, that all things that are jointly needed and used ought to be jointly owned. That industry, the basis of our social life, instead of being private property of the few and operated for their enrichment, ought to be the common property of all, democratically administered in the interest of all. I am opposing a social order in which it is possible for one man who does absolutely nothing that is useful to amass a fortune of hundreds of millions of dollars while millions of men and women who work all the days of their lives secure barely enough for their wretched existence. And I'm not sure there's any sense that is outdated. Yeah. You probably could list the names of the 9,000 people that are the 1% in the country and ask what they do that's socially useful exactly. to our society. We could probably name them. Yeah. Uh, if we <laughs> knew somebody in computers, we could probably get an app that people could put on their iPhone to look them up. <laughs> I, um, equally important besides that and the, and the particular names is the, is the kind of society that we um, live in. And one of those questions is what kind of political representation do we have? Um, they talk about our two-party elections, but in most cases, it's hard to become even a candidate in one of those parties, even that, unless you've been vetted or you have your own right. um, funds. And I know that Debs uh, spoke to that too. Did you have another? Uh, did you have another? I read? had one on his his vision, but okay. I could I could speak okay. to his. No, well, before we before we get to that, then let me ask you this other question because you said. Uh, Again, it made me think of the 21st century today. You said that Debs and his party were denied, well, not Debs, but his party was denied seats in the U.S. Congress, were denied seats in the New York House of Representatives because of their opposition to the war. Right. Um, 
what does something from the 20th century have to say for us in the 21st century in terms of wars? Well, I would think that this is where the Patriot Act is going back to, is all of a sudden you're talking about criminalizing speech. So they've never, the Supreme Court has never repealed their monumental decisions of Debs versus the United States, Schenck's versus the United States, and Abrams versus the United States, the holy trinity or unholy trinity of decisions where they basically said the First Amendment doesn't apply in the times of national emergency. And that's what they sent Debs to jail for? Yes, okay. because he was never accused of bombing or encouraging bombing or any sort of terrorist act. He was accused of undermining the war effort by speaking out and making people question the war. And what, what was that, in one speech or many speeches? Many speeches, but okay. Canton's the one, specific one they Canton, went. Ohio, Canton, Canton, Ohio, Ohio speech from the back wrote, of a train? Or no, was it in a it was, was in, in a an assembly big yard, yeah. Okay. And but they they had a stenog governor a government stenographer there taking down. Is that the speech. speech in this book? Yes, it is. The Canton Ohio speech. So, yeah. if, if people want to see what you could say in 1912 that would throw you in jail, um, get a get, essentially yeah, right. Exactly. You can't say these. I mean, things. ten years in a federal penitentiary. I mean, we're not talking about some sort of slap on the wrist. I mean, that's that's pretty bad. And they took it. You know, and again, that was one of, I think, the failings of Debs' movement is they really did believe in the Bill of Rights, and they had all these liberal lawyers, I think including Clarence Darrow, telling them, this is a violation of the Bill of Rights. We're going to win this on appeal. And they didn't. Okay. They, they so lost So does that it. mean we don't believe in the Bill of Rights? No, he very much <laughs> believes in the Bill of Rights. He just thinks they should be enforced. Okay. <laughs> so, they, so they were believing that not only that it, that it exists and it's a good thing, but they trusted that the institutions would support those that's what they Bill thought. of Rights and they find out that that's not the case. Right. Okay. That okay. even the big liberal justices in the Supreme Court said freedom of speech does not mean the right to yell fire in a crowded uh, theater. Famous statement. That's in the Supreme Court justice. I want to say it was Brandeis. I don't yeah. know. I forget. Yeah, I've heard, we hear that all the time. Yeah. You have the right. Another thing that seems different now than 100 years ago is it seemed like 100 years ago there wasn't a, this widespread public animosity to any, anything that ended with an ism, like socialism, anarchism, communism, Marxism, Debsism, mm -hmm. right? I mean, but today there seems, you know, don't call me a feminist, I'm not a feminist. Or, or the more recent one that just boggles my mind is Islamist. Um, I could not imagine somebody saying Jewist and getting away with it, but Islamist somehow seems to be a label that's used. So at the same time, there seems to be a resurgence of uh, what? The critique of capitalism as a system that meets our needs, um, not even not abroad, but also in this country. So in that sense, uh, um, again, the subtitle of the book is Socialism and Class Struggle. What kind of society or what kind of socialism would Debs have been um, asking us to look at? And I, th I yeah, think that's the well, other. He basically said, and I'm quoting directly here from his magnificent speech, I can see a world where thrones have crumbled and where kings are dust. The aristocrats of idleness have perished from the earth. I can see a world without a slave, man at last free. Nature's forces have by science been enslaved, lightning and light wind and wave, frost and flame, and all the secret subtle forces of the earth and air are the tireless toilers for the human race. I can see a world of peace, adorned with every form of art, with musics, myriad voices, thrilled while lips are rich with words of love and truth, a world in which no exile sighs, no prisoner mourns, upon which the shadow of the cruel gallows no longer falls. I can see a world where labor reaps its full reward and work and worth go hand in hand. I can see a race without disease of flesh or brain, shapely and fair, married harmony of form and function. And as I look, life lengthens, joy deepens, love canopies the earth, while over all in the great dome there shines the eternal star of hope. Thank you. Thank you. It's a lot longer than a soundbite we might hear in a campaign speech today. It's almost poetic, but it gives you an idea that, uh, that uh, a socialist like Debs was a real humanist and somebody that was interested in the, w the welfare of the entire world. So 
Uh, I, ho I hope people, I hope your book does well. I hope people uh, uh, turn to history, um, your profession. This, this, this is kind of a tag question. We don't have a lot of time, but I understand that Debs um, did not participate in the internal debates in the Socialist Party. And I wonder if you could talk to that, and you mentioned before Occupy Chicago not having a political program. What does that tell us, kind of the negative of the Debs legacy? I think the negative of the Debs legacy is, is really that he didn't have a clear conception of how a political party should be organized. How to get from here to there. How to get from here to there. He really had a lot of almost, you might say, naive faith that it would evolve out of the growth of the movement, mm -hmm. not of exercise of free speech and free elections. He didn't have a really vision of how he would deal with, for example, government repression. So outstanding organizer, outstanding orator, outstanding speaker, major figure, but didn't necessarily put it together in a program that in they every could program. move us forward. Yes. But on the other hand, I just want to quickly interject, he was one of the foremost leaders for his time in advocating complete equality for African Americans. Yep. And the Socialist Party, unlike the Democratic and Republican Party, accepted African Americans as completely equal members. Yeah. In fact, the last part of this book is a speech he gave before a rally to elect A. Philip Randolph to uh, a district committee from, from New York when he was running as excellent, a socialist. Excellent. It sounds like there's a, a ma many things we could learn from this brief glimpse of history. I thank you for doing the book, and thank you for joining us here today. This is Calumet Roundtable. Um, thank you for tuning in, a student-produced interview show with academics and researchers. Um, we will see you next time. Thank you.